In this episode of the podcast, we're talking to Pratik Nayak. Now, Pratik is not only a friend, he's one of the most talented and skilled creative professionals that I know. Pratik is a photographer, a well-established and well-known retoucher. He's a developer of software and resources for photographers. He's an entrepreneur, a business person, all of the above, and he's left his mark on the photography industry. I'm excited to have him on the podcast, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about a lot that I guarantee because we both have ADHD. So we'll be a little bit all over the place, but it's going to be a good time. We're going to talk about creativity. We'll talk about our thoughts on education, all the different fake gurus that are kind of coming out of 2020. We're going to talk about what it is to create a business and kind of how we feel the best way is to go about creating products that and a whole bunch more. So let's jump in. This is the TSS podcast. It's a place for authentic conversations to uncover the stupid, simple truths that help us succeed in business, create better relationships, and lead more fulfilling lives. Welcome to Think Stupid Simple. My friend, Pratik, it is wonderful looking at your face. Now, your face (laughs) is actually over here. So if nice. you guys are watching the video <laughs> and you see me talking to Pratik right here, it's because he's right here. So, it's because he doesn't want to look at my face. It's too beautiful. My face is <laughs> strikingly handsome. It almost like, I don't know if I would put your face next to your work because it almost makes your work look just not. Oh, you know come I mean? on. That, guys, if you, want, if you want to boost your ego, talk to Pi every day. It <laughs> makes your day all better. Well, Homie, we have a ritual here. This is the content creation candle. This is a little thing that we start at the beginning of every, really, I I do this anytime I'm creating any sort of content whatsoever, but it's kind of our, what scent is it? This scent is sand and fog. Sand and fog. Wow. Are we going to do like a, 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 a seance here to, 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 you know, bring out some good vibes. A seance is like, like ohms, like ohm, yeah. like that kind of, we can. Yeah. We definitely can. <laughs> I feel like I might put people to sleep. Ohm. <laughs> Pratik, you are an incredibly talented person. I am so grateful that you're, you're joining us on the podcast. And um, I know that this platform for you is going to be different because mm-hmm. this is no longer just a photography platform. I have... I don't know about you, but I feel like in many ways I have, I have came, I have seen, I have conquered. No, that's not the, that's not the right <laughs> way. I've, I've not conquered anything. Um, but I want to talk about more than just photography. Hence kind of this whole route that we've taken down stupid, simple, the book, um, you know, mm-hmm. as well as just this think stupid, simple podcast. Mm-hmm. So dude, you can talk about anything as long as it's authentic. Ah, it comes from it. your heart and soul. Like I, yeah. if you have offensive opinions, I want to know them. <laughs> <Mateek>. <laughs> is this a, is this like a catch? Is this like, we got you? <laughs> yes. This is like, let's, let's cancel critique. This is, yeah. well, let's get you to say something. No, this whole thing was orchestrated for me. I know. This is, uh, if, if anyone's going to be canceled, it's, it's, it's probably me. I have some uh, pretty <laughs> wild opinions. Hey, tell me this, I, um, uh-huh. before we even like what has happened to people being able to agree to disagree? Oh man. You know what? I've actually had that issue with my own platform too, with my personal page. I remember, so for those of you who don't know, I, you know, me and Pi go back a long time and he actually gave me my first, one of my first. I would say podcast opportunities years ago. Do you remember oh. that Pi? You interviewed me. Oh, and, and way, way back. I came, yeah. Like it was back then. And, and I still remember that because it opened up a lot for me. Yeah. And so maybe awesome. this is partially, partially due to, due to that happening. But um, my personal profile was somewhere that I actually would be very open and, and just honest with for everything. And I'm pretty funny in the sense that I like to make fun of really bad Photoshop content and just <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But then eventually what happened was people started getting offended by even the smallest things. And I, I want to be very vague about this just because I don't know, you know, who's going to be offended listening to this. <laughs> don't ironically. even worry if people, that's kind of the whole premise is like, let's get back to authenticity. Let's get back to having good conversations. Let's get back to the fact that it's okay to have differing opinions. Yeah, that's true. Like, like, so keep going, be, and, and be yeah. specific. I mean, you don't right, have to. So, 
I, you know, I'll give you a specific inc- incidence. I was posting about a um, an image that I had seen done horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. And I was just very honest about it, telling people that, you know what, it shouldn't really be like this. And look at how they messed up this thing. And it's also very educational because I feel like in humor and in poking fun of things that we see out there in the world, we actually educate people of what not to do in an in interesting way. For sure. Because you're like me where if the content is kind of boring, you might zone out a little. But if it's <laughs> engaging, you you know, you stay around and you listen to it. And it worked for a while. And I, I remember eventually what happened was that my community got big enough where someone re- realized who had actually retouched that photograph. And he was in the comments like, hey, like, how could you how could you say that about my work? Yeah. And I was like, because I'm very honest about it and I don't like it. So I'm going to I'm going to be quite frank and tell you why I don't like it. And eventually I noticed that everything that I posted from then on started getting more kickback than actual like engagement in the community. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what to do about that because I feel like I couldn't be myself anymore. But people still wanted to follow me. So I was at this weird crossroad. Interesting. And yeah. It's it's so weird how like I, I kind of feel like 2020 is this year that is almost forcing people to be somebody that they're not in many ways. Like absolutely it's kind of you're 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 essentially being forced to be a conformist uh because if otherwise then we fear being canceled right that's how that's how bad and strong the culture is right now um i feel like it's worse than that families are getting threatened too yeah it's at that level it's it's going and this is by the way that that was anthony um the disembodied voice hello Uh, we have to introduce him on every podcast since he doesn't have a camera on his face (laughs) but if if you hear the disembodied voice that's anthony um no but it's kind of wild like the way that 2020 has shaped, how is it that political beliefs now have something to do with your like racist or not racist or everything has been blended in this weird zone of like, mm-hmm. if we disagree, it, you're not, you're not on the same team. Yeah. And there's all, there's also the other side of the spectrum that people don't talk about, which is like positive conformity, which means that like, for example, if you want to be successful on Instagram, you must follow these posting strategies. You must present in a way where it fits the narrative of everyone else who creates engaging content. Now, TikTok has this thing too, where we're all trying to figure out and you do such a good job at it. But I think like you've really studied what it takes for people to be engaged in that platform and how it's different from like YouTube. Because for me, I came from more on the YouTube side and the education side where we had long timeframes in order to present something. Yeah. But now with things like TikTok, everyone's trying to to compete for that first initial second yeah, and then the rest of it comes after. So it's like a, a one minute play that everybody has to then conform to. And even though it's a positive thing, I feel like, again, it's still not being our th- authentic selves just to fit in the narrative of gaining followers. I, I, I agree. And, and I feel like this podcast, the, the book that I've been writing for a while, this is my pushback against all mm-hmm. of this because like yeah. as much as I like TikTok is probably the most fun that I've had in a long time on any social media platform. I don't find the other platforms that fun. I feel like Instagram yeah. is this fake world. It's this fake place of post pretty mm-hmm. pictures and make your life seem like something it's not. And yeah. then you have Facebook, which just feels like, you know, it's kind of it's a very negative place. Like it feeds you a lot of stuff that's just going to get you kind of going because it's engaging. Um, so I, have had a lot of fun on that side, but at the same time, it, it emphasizes the entire notion of clickbait of getting somebody's attention. in. it used to be, you have 10 seconds to get their attention on a website. You have five seconds within a title, your title better be enticing. You better be, you know, it, it needs to be clickable. It needs to be all these things. And, And now it's like you've taken that and put it on steroids with TikTok where you have a second, like you said, one to two (laughs) seconds before somebody swipes. And if you look at like, like I have taken these tutorials and condensed them down into these 30 second chunks and I'll look at the average watch time and it's like a 30 second tutorial. The average watch time is 11 seconds. Wow. So I'm at this place where I'm like, you know what? 
I want to go the exact opposite direction. I'm doing, yeah. I want to do long form. I want to have authentic conversations. And, and to be honest, I feel like the only place where you can gain a, a good understanding of a person is through actual long form conversations. Yes. Like beyond I, 11 seconds. <laughs> yeah. You can't go onto somebody's Facebook post and take a snippet out and be like, I know who you are. You're a complete a-hole. You are racist. You're a misogynist. You are all these. Doesn't that sound like a massage therapist? I always think of a oh, massage yeah. therapist when I, think, when I hear misogynist, I'm like, Nope, not massage therapist. That's different. I feel at peace already, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's frustrating dude, because you are more than than simply a, uh, you, you know, like your Photoshop critique, hmm. you're more than just being goofy and poking fun at something, but yeah. that's what you get consolidated down to. Right. Through it's these like typecasted. Platforms. Yeah. It's like actor typecasting. And even with you, you know, it's that's 11 seconds are on already somebody being engaging. And yes. so what happens is the second they swipe from you to someone else, there's another person who's already engaging, but in a different emotional like set of, of feelings. So what happens is you go on a roller coaster of emotions where you're in, educated, you're then inspired, that you're then sad, and then you're then entertained. And then five minutes have passed and you feel really confused, wondering why you can't sleep because all your emotions are now awake and you can't focus on it. your own partner that's in front of you because now they're not as entertaining as TikTok is. Yeah. So what happens is everything else in life gets so boring. It's like a, it's like literally a drug that, uh, that has beaten all the other drugs that have come in the market. It is. And, and if you think about it, it's impossible for any one person to be that entertaining because what you have on TikTok, like there is no way what you have on TikTok is the best of the world, <laughs> like the entire world trying to entertain you in 10 seconds. There's no way a single person can be like, you know what? I got this. Let me just keep you going. So it's I, like I, having a jester in medieval times, you know, like I was just reading about how jesters actually did more than entertain people. They were also buffers for kings when they, they were out of line at parties with other kings and really? they would deflect. Yeah, they would be they would they were kind of like the real life TikTok where they would have to do all things correctly, whether it's recite stories or whether it's, you know, saving the king's butt from being murdered by another civilization that wanted to come and take over their kingdom stuff like that it's it was really fascinating they did more Wait, than entertain so yeah. tell me more of this so this is like if anthony were the king and yeah. he was at a party and he said something ridiculous and and it offended the other kings yeah i as the jest would jester would be like i'd make some ridiculous like let's say today's world some racist yeah. comment just to pull the attention away i'd be like yeah <laughs> exactly so like let's say let's say anthony let's say anthony said something that offended you right yeah um then the jester would actually offend anthony and make the other that make you laugh so that oh, it wouldn't hilarious. be as 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 like treasonous or you know whatever so the solution yeah. to all of this is a personal <laughs> jester that follows each of us around yes <laughs> this i is... think that's why that's what anthony's there for today <laughs> okay we we need the postmates of jesters <laughs> just download the app you can have but a gesture you know, coming to you. that's that's kind of what tiktok is there for because now people like brands are approaching the people on tiktok to to hire them because they're not just influencers they're people who are pushing brands in a very organic authentic way yeah and they're almost like gestures for hire yeah no i i, I agree and the advertising through tiktok has probably been my favorite form of advertisement yeah. you know like it's I mean, I, 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 there, there's a few good examples of good advertising on YouTube, but for yeah. the most part, like I'm good with just somebody saying like, this is sponsored, you know, like, but there are some people that like, like mango street is one that comes to mind. If you guys uh, are on YouTube, check out mango street. They, uh, they, and I don't know how they t have the time to do this, but like they do these ridiculous, almost story driven advertisements one of them was like they're getting married for a square space it's like a fake marriage and it's like funny and kind of quirky and they're like we're just so happy that square space could come and bring us together it's like it's kind of <laughs> ridiculous but i was like if you had the time you literally need a several days to create yes. that advertisement um which yeah. for most people is probably not going to be worth it considering i don't know i don't know what they what, what they might pay but for a few thousand and, bucks, that's a lot of time. And I get sucked into it because some of these ads are so good that they're so original. I don't even know that notice that I'm watching an ad 
until literally after the 11 second mark and they already got you by then and i have yeah. to i just have to watch the rest because the story is really interesting yeah now i uh okay so i have several questions i wanted to know what you've been up to lately but before we do that i know i already introduced you and and you are a very special person with incredible talent and skill but I'd like to actually show some of his images. So Anthony, would you pull up Pratik's work? Um, so you are a photographer as well as a retoucher on top of that, and an educator and a developer of artistic tools. Oh, I wonder I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of things, but just look at the work. I mean, it's an incredible body of work. Uh, a lot of these you shot yourself, right? Is this all images that you've shot and retouched? So these are the ones that are retouched for my clients specifically. Okay. These are specifically then, for clients. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. And then where could we see just your personal work? Uh, my personal work is mostly on Instagram. If you go to shot by Pratik, um, shot by P R A T I K. And this is also my retouching Instagram, but there you yeah. go. So solstice retouch is your, your client work, right? Right. And yeah. This is your personal work. I mean, it's it incredible. Is. Like your photography is incredible. The retouching, the, how, how long are you spending on a typical image? <laughs> like, like one of these, any one of these retouches. You want to hear an interesting story and this always shocks people, but then they're like, first it's like shock. I'm going to call it shock and awe because first they get surprised and then they get educated and then they try it out. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really haven't told anybody this in like a public setting so far. So you're going to be the first person yes. to hear about this. Um, but for my personal uh, photography, I actually retouch everything in um, web res. I don't do the full res for most really? of my work. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, because everything that I've done so far or for my particular circumstance, because my personal work is mostly personal projects and things that I'm delivering to to people that I'm working with uh, on a on a like a trade level, basically. For those images that don't need to go in print, I do them all in web res because they primarily end up online. Interesting. And, and what happens? Here's here's the positive things about this. Now, what happens me, is real quick. Let me for the people uh, that are not photographers, uh, let me explain that. Web right. res is essentially lower resolution. So Pratik is you're, you're saying that you're you're basically editing these images on lower resolution because they're specifically going to be used primarily on devices, right? Versus high resolution right. that needs to go into print. Exactly. So they're either going to be used on Instagram. They're primarily going to be used on um, you know like our post social media's websites, uh, mobile, and they ne they rarely go into print. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. and, and the reason for this is, is a, I get a lot more images done. Yeah. And so I'm able to actually give the model and my, the people that I'm working with a ton more images. And because of that, they actually post more of my work than anyone else's because they get to pick and choose their own favorites as well. Oh. And that gives me so much traction from their communities it just yeah. flows back to me tremendously and that's i have so more content to post and if somebody then if i get the question a lot that says if a, a model that i'm working with or a, a client that i'm working with if they want something for print then what happens like, yeah. what do you do if you're like hey you know please send me the high res yeah well in those small circumstances i'll do the high res because it's still i still net a, a time savings of like 90 percent Interesting. <laughs> so tell me this, what is the difference um, from, cause what you're essentially trying to prevent is when you load up an image at full resolution, these cameras today capture ridiculous amounts of resolution, like 40, yeah. 50 megapixels is very common. So when you load up a high res image, you see every single detail, poor flaw in the face, all of that stuff. It's all captured right there. Yeah. So you're editing at a lower resolution to kind of prevent from over editing, right? So you're not, you're not essentially editing too much, editing things that nobody's going to be able to see because it's just on an iPhone or on Instagram or whatnot. Yeah. But what's the difference between that versus just editing the full resolution image, but scaling the image down small? Well, the difference is you end up actually noticing still all the blemishes that are left over it's almost impossible to prevent yourself from zooming in even further and trying to to fix it like so you still just, see it 
Yeah, you still see it. And you're still going to have to do the work anyway, because if you have to revisit and do the print size, you're yeah. still going to have to go in and, and do it at, at the proper scale. Interesting. That's a great yeah. little time saver right there. That That is a, a stupid, simple time saver. <laughs> that is yeah. a, that's awesome. And okay. Of, of course, this is not related to things that you might have to print and you know you're probably going to print. But, you know, the test shoots that you do, the stuff that you do for fun, you know, don't don't water it down by wasting so much time because, A, we, don't forget, a lot of the stress for photography comes from the fact that, oh, the shoot's done, you had a lot of fun, but now you got to go and edit those photos. And some people hate doing that. Yeah. And if you just want to go and shoot more and have fun and post photos and, and, you know, just keep on sharing content, then, then don't waste your time. If things are never going to be seen in full res. And again, you have the raw files. You can do it anytime you want to. That's a great tip. Now, mm -hmm. Anthony, can you go back to his work? I have, uh, I have another question for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Now, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I already know the answer to this, but I feel like it's a fun conversation and one that, that I've been asked several times about. Um, so. I noticed that you shoot a lot of kind of boudoir lingerie. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. your primary bread and butter is fashion. Um, and you have an incredible, is it fiance or, or are you guys married? We are married. Yeah. You're married. That's right. I, I saw, know. I saw your wedding photographs. So Bella, <laughs> what is, what does she think when you are doing those shoots? Is she, is she completely cool with it? I love this question. I, and this is the best question because a lot of actually men and women come to me and they say like, Hey, I want to shoot more boudoir. And how do you get your wife's quote unquote yeah, permission? It's a question that, that comes a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and every guy's like, how could you, how are you married? And also shoot women like, what is, what do you, how do you do that? And, <laughs> and interestingly enough, so I think it comes down to intent and, and for, I'll explain what I mean. So even before I met Bella, I actually got started in the retouching world in um, for like working with like Playboy and Maxim and uh -huh. all of that. I actually never did fashion and beauty as much as I did that. Oh, and so my retouching that. clients um, initially were, I think my first retouching client was a Playboy photographer, my main one. And um, we worked together for like three or four years. And so I remember retouching a lot of that work back then. And I was so fascinating because the photographer that I worked with, he went by the name of Icona Photography. Mm -hmm. And his work was so different than the typical glamour photographer where he actually studied under a fashion photographer. Interesting. By the name of Richard Dubois. I've heard and that name. they're both, yeah, they're both based in Canada. And um, I found it so interesting because the main difference in his work and other fashion photographers work was just the clothing, the difference in wearing lingerie or yeah. wearing, or wearing uh, dresses and the lighting was very fashion based and it was so clean and classic and very interesting. And so I, my background was always in that field. And when I met Bella, she knew that, and she'd always watched me retouch women. And she asked me like, why I was so drawn to that side of things. And I realized one thing is that my background in art and drawing and painting stemmed from fine art. And so I always studied um, art in my day, whether it's classical art, drawings, whether it's statues and sculptures, I was always drawn to the human form. Yeah. I'm, I was addicted to like health and fitness. And so for me, the human form and the body has always been in my life, whether it's through art, whether it's personal health, whether it's, you know, like drawing. And now naturally when I progress into photography, I love shooting that more than fashion because for me, clothes actually got in the way of structure. You know, mm -hmm. I love, even if it's things like shooting um, architecture or shooting landscape, it always comes down to structure and form. Yeah. And having fashion for me wasn't the type of form that I was looking to capture because it wasn't as natural as shooting the human form. And I think automatically those references came into my photography and I just really enjoyed shooting that a lot more. And I loved having capturing the form in a way that most people couldn't do or don't do because yeah. I tried to not keep it so so glam like i try to keep it very artistic and i try to keep it very i would say like statuesque you know if you look at my work i try to really embody those those vibes and yeah. bella actually comes to me on shoots as well like she comes and helps with like the posing sometimes she comes and assists with like the lighting she gives me directions and we collaborate a lot in that way that's, and so that's for amazing. her it's been great because even with her work, she's a fine art photographer and um, she deals with human form a lot where she works with fine art models to, to create her fantasy work. And I actually go and assist with her lighting as well on set and ideas with posing. 
So I, I think we both shoot in that realm and we get inspiration off each other. She also helps with a lot of my editing too, with her color grading direction, with her choice in, in selects. Like we actually f- work together quite a bit in, in everything that we do. And she notices that whenever I'm shooting, it's very, very serious. And I take, I do a lot of research into my shoots. So it's, it's the intent I think that matters the most. No, I agree. Like to, to go back to that question of, um, how do you do this yeah. and not get your spouse upset? Yeah. It's almost like the intention behind that question is already off because yes. there's, there's a certain, when, when that question is asked, there's a certain assumption that these shoots are sexual when in yeah. reality they're not, they right. are professional environments where you're shooting something sensual, but you're creating shapes and art from that. And there's at least on an appropriate set, um, Mm -hmm. there it's a, it's a space of safety and comfort. It's not one of, you know, sexuality. So, so it's, it's a very interesting one because I I found that usually the question itself tells me the intention of the person. And, And if your intent is to sexualize the process, uh, well, that, that, that really falls in this weird in between of like more pornography than photography. And, and it's kind of in this odd space, which interestingly uh, we have a former writer who actually took his artwork in that direction where basically he went from portraiture to boudoir. And -hmm. then he went to something that he, I mean, he's almost kind of as far as I know, one of the first people that I've seen do this, but basically point of view erotica. Right. Yeah. He is, he is the modeling element involved Mm -hmm. in these. So he'll find a model and it's, it blows my mind, like on many different levels that this is even (laughs) possible. And, uh, I'm not going to specifically say the name because I don't even know if it's legal, like what it is, but, um, he's essentially like, like his own actor in porn. Like it is, it is erotica, but it's, I, I would say that it is more tastefully done than, than most anything that you would see, but it is, it is erotica. Now, the question that I have is what's the difference between mm-hmm. prostitution? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you this question. <laughs> Here's how we are <laughs> deviating here, but it's such an interesting thing. Cause like w- w- you, it, it's illegal to go and say, you know, give me a hundred bucks and I'll have sex with you. But mm-hmm. it's, not illegal to say, give me a hundred bucks and I'll take your pictures while we're right. having sex. <laughs> like I don't right, understand yeah. the difference between those know. two things. I think the difference is if you pay taxes on it or not, I guess. <laughs> Do you pay taxes? <laughs> that is because that's what a lot of the industries, that's what it's kind of like, right? Like you, you know, it's all filmed and everything, but you know, if there's any monetary thing, they're all incorporated and everything. So like, it's, that's it's, what's so it, odd about the porn industry is it's yeah it's it's legal prostitution but if you're filming it right it's okay if the government knows about it it's okay i yeah i think it's because they classify <laughs> under entertainment it's like yeah that's what it is it's just you're right i mean why doesn't every person that wants to be a prostitute classify what they do as under like i mean that doesn't make any sense to me because it just doesn't make any sense like it's it's you either it's allow it all or you don't that's true. And I agree with that. Like, I think it should be legalized, you know, like it shouldn't be something that is, is looked down upon just because of the intent or the, the, the platform that it's appearing on or whether it's a private or not. And in fact, it should be the other way around. If it's a private business, it's between two consensual people, then it shouldn't really be an issue in many, you know, many places it isn't, but it's something, I think that's a topic that this country, the U S specifically has to kind of overcome because there's a lot of sex workers out there, you know, and they're also in danger. And it's something that is trivialized. And I am a proponent for it just because it's something that I think we all, I think we're all kind of hypocrites in that manner where a lot of people will watch it, but they will also look down upon people who do it in a private business. That is the majority of people. The majority yeah. will watch, but also con- like condemn. And right. it's, yeah. It blows my mind. And the same thing, and I, I, you probably didn't expect to hop onto this podcast and talk about this, but <laughs> that's why it's fun. So exactly, but I, I'm kind of along those same lines as, as far as like all of this stuff should be legalized. I mean, from, from drugs to prostitution, because when it's not, 
Right. It's so much more deadly. I mean, you right. create these entire black markets where now it's no longer safe. It's no longer anything. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's condemned. It's all these different things. And it, 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 it's crazy that 10 years ago, if you wanted to get, I mean, not even 10 years ago, if you wanted to get a joint 10 years ago, mm-hmm. you were, I mean, when I was in high school, if you wanted it, not that, you know, I was pursuing this stuff a lot, but I knew that if I wanted to get any form of drugs in high school, I would have to go to some shady back alley deal, you yeah. know, deal with people that had guns, deal with people that had all sorts of stuff, uh, just to get that. Now you can freaking hop onto grass door or it's essentially the postmates of, of weed delivery <laughs> yeah. and have it delivered to your home within 30 minutes. These, these MFers will get you your weed faster than McDonald's can make a sandwich. Like that's it is, true. It, it's insane, but that's the difference of, to me, this whole notion of like social condemning versus mm-hmm. like opening up something you can make something safe and 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 you can make it you can draw tax dollars from it you can do so much make it an entire industry but it's this weird perception that we have things like why would alcohol be okay but you know marijuana not be um Mm -hmm. and to me it comes down to pratik is it not the job of parents to teach their children what they should and should not do. Well, we've seen how that goes, though, haven't we? <laughs> well, it's like it's like parents. Like, I mean, f- yes, theoretically, but then like there's so many parents who are also not good parents in terms of teaching their kids because they might also socially be in the wrong too, like having an understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Like they were also taught the wrong thing. So then what is the answer to that? Like what about parents who are just not good at teaching the kids the right thing to do? It, the the solution can't be let's hand it over to the government Definitely and to our no. educational institutions. Let's let them decide for us. Yeah. The, like in the home, I have four children. Mm-hmm. I'm not scared of them going and doing drugs and going and doing these things because we talk about it in the home. Like we're, right, we're yeah. discussing these things openly uh, and, and where there's this, I almost feel like where there's this thing that is forbidden, it mm-hmm. becomes that much more tempting. Right. Yes. Like if, if something's illegal, if something's not, you know, but if it's in front of you and you're like, yeah, you could have alcohol or you could have a, a cigarette or you could have whatever. And your parents talk to you about it and you're like, yeah, but that's kind of dumb. Like you shouldn't be doing that stuff. Yeah. Like this is why it becomes this easy decision. And if you do decide to have something, you, you can moderate yourself. Exactly. And also it's kind of like the speed limit or like when you're right, when things become illegal, there's studies that show that typically usage does go down a lot in yeah. terms of once it does become legalized. So I, I, I wonder when when we'll get in this country where things like that are legalized because we're so slow at everything. Like even even things like internet speeds were really slow in comparison to other countries, like getting that up to up to spec compared sure. to what everyone else is doing. So it'll probably take a really long time for us to do I like anything. that you compare it to internet speeds. <laughs> yeah. like, let me let me throw in this one really <laughs> annoying thing, <laughs> internet yeah. speeds. I was like, yes, I did it. That's my Easter egg in this little podcast. That's my Easter egg. No, I, I, I feel like it's going to take a long time because so many of these different uh, concepts, they get politicized and used as platforms. I yeah. mean, this entire war on drugs, what was this, Reagan's thing where it just got... Mm-hmm it becomes part of his whole thing that he creates this. Everybody is now for Reagan because he's against the war on drugs. And then we're 30 years deep onto this war that we're losing Mm -hmm. because of propaganda and politics. Like, right. Yeah. It's kind of like masks, right? Like when it became politicized, it suddenly split everything up and now everybody's either for or against them. Like, why is it either for or against? Why can't we just agree that the science is good? Identical. And I, and I, I feel like this going back to kind of like, this is what makes it not okay to have disagreements anymore. It, it's what it's what puts us into this. You're either on this side or on that side. And in, in reality, it's more like, well, there's a middle line. There's a mm-hmm. middle line where you can see both sides, make decisions for yourself, but you can understand, you know, what people yeah. are doing. I think that's also because of frustration, like especially now more than ever, we are so quick to like cancel people and we're so quick to do that because this year, particularly, everybody's already frustrated being inside and, and with their personal issues and maybe they're out of work or whatever. So that gets pushed on to other, other people and projected when they don't like something even more than ever. It's, it holds up a microphone to their feelings and yeah. then they project it even more than they normally would because they would be distracted by other life issues. 
you have time too. like yeah. during normal years, nobody's got time to give a crap about, oh, critique, like, you know, said this about someone's Photoshop work. Nobody gives right. an F because everyone's doing something. But when everyone's mm-hmm. sitting in front of their computers, then it's like, OK, yeah, what else yeah. are we going to do? Let's get right. on somebody about something. But OK, going back to your work um, and talking about I have I have so many questions on this side and, and thoughts uh, around just I love it. Yeah, I, I, I'm all over the place, but that's I'd like to think, Pratik, that that's why people listen, because it's I do. That's why I listen. It's more interesting than just <laughs> sitting here and talking about megapixels. You are okay. the TikTok algorithm of people. You like every moment there's a different <laughs> new little every 10 seconds. There's something different that you like. Thank you, my friend. I, I appreciate that very much. I do have ADHD, actually, so that probably plays so into do I. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Tremendously. Yes. Okay. So, um, we understand each other. So Mm -hmm. on this photography side, so at some point, uh, not only did you kind of, you developed a lot of retouching techniques that I feel like are very well known in the industry. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe uh, it's difficult to say who did something first, but I would definitely say that, uh, you were somebody that popularized so Mm -hmm. many of the yeah. techniques that are are used. And I'm regularly coming on a Facebook and like, Pratik, how do I do this? And you're like, just go watch this video or do you want me to call you? And I'm like, no, dude, I want to waste your time. Um, but it, that is not only something that is very cool in and of itself, but you've also systemized it. So you created mm-hmm. education around that, which I believe is, is that through Portrait Masters, your, your full education on retouching? Yeah. So in fact, I think it was uh, a few years ago, we did this retouching series uh, platform, which is on the portraitmasters.com. And it's basically, you know, kind of like an ADHD person's way of learning retouching, <laughs> <laughs> who, who may or may not already kind of already know what the techniques are about. Yeah. And the reason I, I wanted to put that together was I realized, personally, for me, I was a very slow learner in school. I just learned really slowly. And I had to sit down after someone said something, I had to sit down, look at it a few times, and they're like, oh, now I get it. Now let's talk about the next thing. Yeah. And school wasn't good for me in that sense because they talked about something, they went straight on to the next thing and said, hold, hold on a minute. Like, I don't understand what's happening. And so the same thing happened with photography content and education with retouching, where these videos would kind of assume your general level of understanding on some topics. Mm -hmm. And and they don't understand that a lot of people don't know the basic things sometimes. And even if they did, how can you teach in a manner that encompassed uh, and, and, you know, really thought about both, both sides. And so I made this platform because you're able to kind of dissect each topic individually. So if you want to learn like, Oh, how do I do here? Here's a five minute video on that. You don't have to spend six hours or go through a, uh, a little, you know, that's what I love about this is this is, I assume this is what you mean by kind of an HD ADHD way of looking at it, but like everything is broken down to these specific things that you can dive into, um, which I, I, I actually have this course as well. And I found myself like, okay, I need to actually jump into this piece. I need to go back to this one. Um, I love the way that it's laid out. It makes it very easy nice. to go back and forth. So, yeah, and- Oh, go ahead. And I was going to say, like, even if you don't know anything at all about, well, aside from op- how to open Photoshop, there's a full fundamentals, like little module, like a square that has a three and a half hour um, amount of content that you can learn the basic tools before you learn anything else. So it's like if, you, if you're kind of a beginner, but also, you know, want to see advanced stuff, it's all there. That's so cool. And then it was after that that you went and created infinite tools, right? So this is now... This is now your basically your Photoshop plugin, your tool to take everything that you teach, everything that you do and simplify. Is that right? Kind of. So um, if you go. So we had the first thing, which was our infinite color panel, Uh which uh, that was something that we did for for color grading. And that community actually grew a lot because of this product. And this kind of tells people or gives people suggestions on how to color grade. And it provides basically an infinite number of coloring options for any photograph so that you're able to go in and see, Hey, I like this, or I don't like this. And it educates people as well if they don't know what they're looking for. And then once that happened, um, we decided that we wanted to kind of make more tools. So I, um, we made infinite tools and that website is basically all of our other Photoshop, um, extensions or plugins that people can use on their photographs that do different things. Like if you're trying to say, find, 
a way to even out skin tones because you feel like, you know, your every portrait that you shoot has green, red tint, purple tint, whatever. Yeah. And you're trying to even that out. We have a specific tool on that. Or if you're trying to find a tool that helps you do composite work and you want to have an unlimited number of textures, then we have a tool that uh, provides textures and, and content that you can add to your photographs to amplify mood and, and add to the background and things like that too. Yeah. What's, what's fun to me about all this. I mean, they're incredible tools, number one, but I look at this from more of a business or an entrepreneur standpoint. And so Mm -hmm. outside of just, you know, photography and the photography industry, I feel like there's so much to learn from the, this, this process, because Mm -hmm. what you essentially did was stepped into a craft. You learned that craft well enough to teach it. Mm -hmm. And then you went about and created the tools that were missing for that craft. Uh, which I almost feel like at least for most of the people that I know, that is kind of how entrepreneurship works. You kind of find Mm -hmm. something, you do it, you see gaps and missing pieces and you've made a very seamless transition between all of these things. So I don't know. I I love stepping back and kind of looking at that. That's so fascinating because you're right. It feels like a blueprint of most people where they do just that. And I think it's the right way of doing things. You know, it's, it's the wrong way where, where, where you see people kind of start teaching off the bat, even yeah. though they haven't really mastered what they're doing. And, and, they, and you can tell the intention as well. You know, I feel like this whole conversation is about the intention, but like the intention of actually teaching, you get, you get a sense of who they are based on at what point do they start teaching and the reasons why they teach. For yeah. me, I was always an introvert. I never really liked being in front of the camera. It was people like you and everyone else like, hey, come come do an interview. Like, hey, let's talk about it. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. I don't really know if I should do this. And then <laughs> I don't know if I should. Then, <laughs> yeah. But then but then people were telling me that they actually learned a lot and I would love to see more. And I let I let um the path unfold for me. Yeah. I think a lot of people try to carve paths that don't exist and really really tr- struggle at it because they're not getting the traction they need. And sometimes that's for a good reason. Sometimes the traction is not there because maybe it's too premature. Maybe it's something that you need to come back after a certain period of time. Maybe you need more time to figure things out. And teaching was that for me, you know, I retouched for a long time. Then teaching opened up because it did it. It did so organically. And then because of teaching, I started to listen to people and the gaps that they had in their work. And I was like, wait a second, why doesn't this exist yet? And I kept searching for it and there was no answers for years. And it just kept coming back to me. And I said, wait a second, I need to eventually do something about this because if no one's doing something about this, I should do it. And retouching was that for me too. When I started photo retouching, I started it because there was a gap. And I noticed it because I I saw magazine covers that did not look good. And I knew they didn't look good. I had the aesthetic for it because of my art background. But I just didn't know how they were doing it. There was no education. So I said, I'm going to learn it, A. And I, hopefully they like what I have to teach and why. And then the why stuck. The why came back to me. And people were like, why are you doing it this way? Why, why is there no information out there? Then I said, fine. There's no information out there. I'm going to be putting it out there. And that's how this whole thing happened. Yeah, this, this reminds me of... Um... I, I have said this a couple of times, but I feel like 2020 is going to be the year of the birth of a whole new generation of fake gurus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, do you not see this coming? Like, like 2021 is going to oh, be man. this explosion of come online. I can teach this. I know this. I have mastered this. I've figured out how to make seven figures. First of all, when somebody says, I have learned how to make seven figures. The first thing in my mind is like, well, mother effer, maybe you should just go and do more of that then. Cause like, yes. like, why are you here? Why are you make here? Eight figures. <laughs> but I really am passionate about teaching you how to do yeah. the same thing. And what you're, what you're hitting for me is inauthenticity. Mm-hmm. It's this, like, I don't see an issue with, when somebody starts teaching, right? I will fully admit that I probably started teaching 
before I knew much. And and honestly, I think every educator makes the mistake when they first start educating that they feel like they have to be right. I kind of feel like, you know, the, the more you learn, the more you're like, yeah, there's a bajillion ways to do different things. And I shouldn't be so hard headed and thinking there's only, but at the beginning of something, you're kind of stuck in this, like, there's a, there's a word for this. Uh, there's a phrase, a psychological phrase for this that I forget. It's some, some effect, but you think you're, for lack of a better word, you think you're the shit. Like you're like, okay, this is the way it's done. Right. In the beginning. And then you start going down on that little, on that bar graph and then you go up again at the end or something like that. Yes. You start to kind of come to realize that, holy crap, as you learn (laughs) more and you become better, you realize how little, you know, and your teaching style evolves with it. You become Mm -hmm. more understanding and, and more like, like I'm okay to be wrong. This entire platform, this entire podcast is like, I'm not married to any of my opinions, anything that I have, like I will shape anything. uh, And I feel like that's what it means to kind of be an intellectual person. But (laughs) when I started teaching, I will fully admit that I did not know enough to be teaching necessarily what I was teaching. But the reason I started teaching was because our own people needed education. So our own team members in our photography company needed education. And I thought, well, why not just create, that and make it available to other people too. And it mm-hmm. kind of began to grow and it, and it was like, I'm just trying to fulfill our own needs because the education yes. that we needed did not exist. Yes. So that's how we got thrown into it. And now if I, if I go back and I listen to my earlier stuff and I'm like, let me show you the right way to do something. I'm like, man, <laughs> shut the F up. Like there is no, <laughs> there's many right ways. But and I think that's why for you, um, it, it was so successful because even me, like I, I watch your stuff too. Because A, even if I feel like I know a topic, I'm still going to watch your content because the way you present something, I will still learn things I might have not learned in my foundation. So when I was first learning about photography, you know, we end up skipping some of the basic steps because we're so rushed into getting to the advanced stuff. But the way you teach, it really encompasses and keeps in mind the people that might not know all the basic things that they need to know. And it's done such a nice way where you can see that your intention by is also not self-serving. It's actually meant to help other people. And you can tell that when you're talking, you can tell that your passion is actually helping people because you do that. Even if you're not on camera, you actually like to help people. You like to give back and that shows, but I appreciate the, that, my the difference, the difference with that And the gurus is that you can tell that's not their intention. You can tell how they're excited about making the money off of the people that are wanting to educate them and not the other way around. For sure. And, and I think that, like you said, that inauthenticity shows through and they wind up not really making much money. Um, if they do, they're usually conning people out of their money. Um, and then they usually move on to something else pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned though, like I, it took me a long time to realize and to recognize that my, my passion, um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily like that word, but I'm going to say it because it's the word that we all know, but it's not photography. Um, and, and frankly, like when I see people like you, uh, it makes me realize that I am more a camera owner than I am necessarily a photographer. You are a very well, creative. Those of you who have seen your work, I don't think they'll think otherwise because like even the photography you post and the challenges that you do, especially with like Lee, that's really cool to see. I, I mean, love it's, seeing stuff like that. I, 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 I can take a decent photograph and I have developed some skill in that arena, but I guess my, my, underlying passion is really frameworks. I like creating education that's relatable and easy to understand. Yeah. Um, I started this in language and then it mm-hmm. became, uh, it was originally in Cantonese and Mandarin. I wrote books around how to study and then it became photography and teaching people photography and then business and, you know, the, the kind of editing that we do not necessarily retouch and beautiful stuff like you're, you're, you're doing. Um, and then into like sales and then eventually like realizing, okay, what really drives me is hmm. frameworks. It, it's taking something complicated and breaking it down in a way that anybody can understand it, making it relatable. Yeah. So it, it but it's weird though, because it, you, from the outside, you, you would just think that somebody is, you know, a, a, a photographer or when people look at the, the work that I do, 
they say things like you're, you're skilled or you're talented in, in something. And I'm like, not really. It's kind of like just time, hard work. And, and I really right. like frameworks um, yeah. that help me to like come to these places. But I see the same thing that, that you're doing much of the same thing, developing your own frameworks and then tools around those frameworks. Yeah, that's a good point because for me, it's the same kind of end goal is I like co communities and platforms more than I like even editing. And I love editing and retouching is definitely still number one. You still love comes, retouching. Yeah. The most yeah. like out of everything. And then it comes down to inspiring. I think if I can, if I can take someone and inspire them, motivate them to get off the couch or to make an additional sale or to actually get better at their craft. It's such a fulfilling thing for me because even during when I am sad or when I feel like I'm down, I need to go and help people. Like it's just a natural innate thing where yeah. it's such a weird thing because when I want to help people, I do it because it gives me satisfaction. Yeah. So in a way, when you think about people who like to help people, are also selfish, but in a positive way. It's like sure. selfish, positive selfishness. It's you know? it's not necessarily altruism. It's it's yeah. you appreciate it for yourself. Yeah, like I really enjoy seeing other people get helped and and seeing what they do with it. It's giving yeah. me so much satisfaction. So yeah. no matter what the reasoning is for or the motivation, that's what I like to do. And you do the same thing. Like your frameworks are so great. And I actually had a question for you. Where have you ever had frameworks that have failed and? In comparison to the ones that you felt succeeded, how many have you had just not succeed? Oh, a, a lot of them don't necessarily work out. I mean, now I feel like the best frameworks are the ones that like I know if a framework is going to be worth teaching or if it's worth using because I actually remember it and use it myself. Yeah. Anybody can come up with like a, a stupid, you know, acronym of like, oh, OK, like like this is how you do something. But. A good educational framework is something that you yourself remember and can mm -hmm. actually implement. And if you can't remember it and implement it, then then I just kind of toss it aside. You know what I mean? So one of the frameworks that I use in the since we're talking about photography is CAMP, C-A-M-P. And I was like, I need to come up with a framework that slows people down. People want a light. They just want to jump to, have you noticed this? Like somebody gets a, a light, uh, like a, a flash or something like that. And it's really kind of odd when you when you think about this in a different context. But for the photographer, they get their camera mm -hmm. and they think first of like, now how am I going to light this image? Yeah, And that's the first thing that they jump to. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I developed the camp framework that that says, no, before you light, compose your shot. Think of what you want. Then decide on your intention through ambient light. So ambient light is the second piece camp. Then modify or add light, then photograph. So camp, that is easy enough to remember and, and utilize throughout the process. And so that becomes like a, a good solid framework, but it's weird because like if you were in any other context, if you're Wolfgang Puck, if you're a chef and I was like, here's 10 ingredients, you wouldn't be thinking specifically like, okay, now how am I going to use that butter? I really yeah. got to use that butter, but that's what <laughs> photographers are doing. They're like, like, instead of thinking of the dish they want to make, they're mm -hmm. thinking of one ingredient to use. Have you noticed that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such a good point. I never thought about it that way though, but you're right. It's always, how do you light this? Or how can I light this? Or how am I going to light this? I'm like, what about the emotion? What about the intention? Yeah. And even in my work, right? We were talking earlier about the boudoir stuff and talking about having how it's a safe space for people. But do you know where it really shows where, where where the real beacon lies in the photographs and tells others that this is actually the intention I'm trying to get is not the lighting. Mm -hmm. It's actually the body language. And so for me, when you see body language that's done properly, you see things where the hands are more delicate. You see the like for less sure. tension in particular muscle groups and others. For sure. And that in a subconscious way without seeing the face or without even seeing the expression tells people or tells other women for that matter how natural and authentic that environment was 100 percent. when you when you get the lighting right when you get the color grading right when you get the retouching right all that won't matter if she looks uncomfortable even without seeing her face because sometimes you know there may be good actresses where their faces might be looking normal but their body language looks off yeah. and women will catch that really quickly 
Yeah. And there's there's no working around that. You have to be a genuine person in that environment. You have to make them comfortable. You have to be friends and you have to, you know, provide that. So intention is is everything. So lighting is definitely something that's great that we all should know, but you're 100% correct. Everything else should be the considering factor before all of that. Yeah, that's so interesting that you say that. I never thought about it from that, but when I look at your photographs, there is a comfort there. Now, what's interesting is that we teach, we have a whole posing framework for, you know, wedding photography and couples and whatnot. And I teach posing from body language because it's the only way, it's the only system that you can like actually understand why something isn't working a certain way. But from the standpoint of your, like your, your, uh, lingerie, boudoir, like that kind of work, I never thought about it from that standpoint where, Yes, there is this very comfortable relationship there between the person being photographed and you, uh, mm-hmm. which which is why the images are so pleasing to look at. And you can you can yeah. be held there for long periods of time mm-hmm. uh, and just looking at shapes. Yeah, and there's a, a clear difference in that intention versus right. anything else where that 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 safety, like the 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 environment is not the same thing. And I would say if. To go back to this question, one of the things that you you hit on, um, which is worth emphasizing, is part of you creating a safe environment is having Bella with you. I think that's a yeah. very important piece for guys that are photographing uh, women, uh, especially alone and in boudoir kind of lingerie settings, fashion, all that kind of stuff. There is a safety in bringing on assistants and people of the opposite sex. Yes, 100% for sure, especially in the beginning when you have no idea what you're doing or when you have no idea of what the energy is like. Because, you know, I think what happens is people look at those images and think, oh, that's not that difficult. You're photographing beautiful women. How hard is it? Yeah. That but, is the- for the, <laughs> but then when, you, when you've ever been around a beautiful woman or a beautiful person for that matter, there's a particular energy that they evoke. And that energy creates a lot of tension sometimes. Or that energy can also create a lot of uncertainty because you're not used to that space. Mm -hmm. And when you have that intense energy around that area, things can get really weird if you don't know how to make it comfortable for them or if you don't know how to be comfortable in your own element around that energy. For sure. So I think it's really difficult because a lot of people don't know how to, A, be around that, or they're not used to it. So it's easy to judge from, from the outset, but you're right. In the beginning, having someone from the opposite sex, um, um, from my opposite sex, I should say, works really well because, A, it creates that understanding for both sides. And then it also makes you realize it's not that different than like shooting portraits because once you get comfortable and you you're you're very good in your own element of shooting that kind of stuff then you understand what's going to happen you understand the expectation and things become normal you just talk to like a normal person you're and you're just friends and it's a comfortable situation and it's only weird if you make it weird basically is what i'm trying to say no you're right and you hit on a point that's kind of the same with i i almost feel like any we could say this in a, in a, in a photographic standpoint, but this really applies to almost anything. So you, you mentioned from this standpoint of we're talking about photographing boudoir and lingerie, but I would also argue that you might be meeting a client for the first time selling your portfolio of services. You might be, you know, seeing a client and, and it's going out for a photo shoot with them and their dog. It might be, it could be any of these things, but it's that those introductory moments of getting Mm -hmm. to know somebody and, and trying to bring them into this, that's where the awkward energy and tension always exists. And the people that are good at selling the people that are good at shooting, the people that are good at creating artwork, they're the ones that can be themselves in those moments Mm -hmm. of tension Mm -hmm. until it essentially dissipates. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's kind of gaining this comfort with like, I know you don't know me, but I'm going to continue to be myself and do the things that I would normally do until you relax a little bit. hundred percent. That's the perfect way to put it. And also I always encourage people to be themselves on camera when they're doing Instagrams or whatever, or Facebook lives is because if they meet you and they you're different than what they thought you were, or if they have an idea of who you are in your head based on just your work and they don't know your personality, then it's going to be really weird too. So 
when even when it comes to teaching, people say, hey, you're the same as you are online as you are in person. And I say, yeah, because I don't care if I like have goof ups on, on, on camera or whatever, because it shows who I really am. Mm -hmm. You know, it's even I'm not going to curate myself for something that I'm going to spend so much time doing because it can become really arduous and a lot of work to do that, to become this fake person in order to present something online and then not ha not be able to do that in person when I meet the people that follow me online. So I, I try to be, have continuity there. It's it's almost stressful to think about trying to be a different person. Like if, if you have to have a, and it was funny, Lee and Patrick actually called me out on this at one point uh, where <laughs> we started a video uh -huh. and, uh, and I was like, what's up guys? My name is Pi. And they were like, why aren't you just like talking like normal? And I was like, oh, I'm just projecting. And they're like, why are you projecting? Like, we're all just right here. And yeah. I was like, I guess I'm so used to filming by myself in my, like I had this old studio where like the camera was pretty far and like, these are my, my older editing videos and things like that where like, I'm all by myself and I kind of have to hype myself up, like to be excited <laughs> to do this. So I'd be like, what's yeah. up guys, let's go ahead and jump. And, uh, but as soon as they said, I was like, you're right. Like this isn't that, and I don't need to speak and be anything other than just who I normally am. And it kind of, yeah. It was a great moment, but then I've seen, I've seen people take this to an extreme, dude. I was working with uh, one of my friends and he was, there's all these crazy personalities out here in, in Los Angeles, as you know. Um, but they have this, um, there's this one YouTube channel. I'm not going to call them out on this, but I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> if you watch their videos, it's just the most ridiculous asinine stuff in the world. And I think they're going for like kids and like teens watching this oh, thing wow. uh -huh. but it's a supposed married couple and they just do wild stuff weird mm -hmm. breaking iphones like all this like oh this is this and it's this show and uh they're completely different in real life they're not even like really a couple in real life wow and i'm like man how stressful is it to live two separate lives yeah just to make a living kind of thing yeah my gosh, I never knew that. I never even thought of that. That's the thing, like faking a whole relationship just to. It's, just it's to, a, literally a fake life. Like they pretend to have this life that doesn't actually exist yeah. where they're blowing money and doing all sorts of ridiculous things. But away from that life, none of it's real. Wow. Interesting. Huh. I wonder if that's something that a lot of people are doing or even know about, or if that's a very private thing that no one, they haven't really told anybody. I, I would guess that a lot of YouTube people are, are in that realm of like yeah. creating this. It's weird. It's this weird thing because you create something, right? Like maybe you make a, imagine you make one video and it, and it picks up and it gains traction, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I went on a TikTok, I thought, what is a video that I can do that would fit this format? That's already something about who I am. Right. And so I'm mm -hmm. just doing like condensed photography education, mm -hmm. but imagine your first video is, I don't know, you dressing up in a monkey suit and doing a weird dance. And all of a sudden it gets 10 million views. Yeah. Then you're like, well, I better dress up in a monkey suit again and do a dance. And <laughs> And so you just keep repeating this process until you're known as the monkey suit dancer. And that might not be who you are at all. Yeah. I thought about that too. You're put there because you just kind of follow the wave of what people want to see. There was this guy that, um, I was thinking about this yesterday. There was a guy on, on TikTok, obviously that he, his whole spiel was not to drop his bagel. Have you seen that guy? Not to drop his bagel. Yeah. Like he tries to, he like, he does something where he flips his bagel in the air in different uh -huh. ways and catches it. And he has like a sound bite that says, Oh, like, Oh, you've, I almost dropped my bagel or something like that. That's and, hilarious. um, his, his whole, his whole TikTok account is based on that. And I, and I think I felt so sorry for him because at some point he's going to realize like, this is no one even cares about me. Like no one knows what I do. Like no one knows the other talents that I have. Can he transition from bagel guy to, I don't know, whatever his like passion, like maybe geology. I don't know. You know, like, can he transition from his success, from that to something that he really wanted to do, or he really tried to do initially. Absolutely. And, and I hope so. Like, I hope people give, you know, time and consideration to people like that who want to change their platform up. And well, I think it's possible. 
I think it's possible, but there's a lot of people that are falling into that exact same hole yeah. on TikTok mm-hmm. where like they get some viral. It's a super interesting psychological phenomenon. And being a, a, a student of psychology, I'm a student of everything, but a student of psychology, <laughs> like I'm looking at it like, man, these people, I sure hope that what they're doing is actually something that they enjoy because they're getting locked into it. There was yeah. one account, uh, Angry Actions. And it's this guy one yet. He's a great guy. Like he, he looks like a genuinely cool guy. And I know that guy. Yeah. But you can see this, you know, he, he gets popular for these angry, but like kind reactions to things, right? Like <laughs> he's like, like a nice guy. Yeah. He's angry, so loving <laughs> reactions. But then he starts posting about how he keeps meeting these people in real life. And like, everybody just wants him to do the angry action stuff in real mm-hmm. life. It's like you meet the bagel guy and you're like, Hey, can you toss a bagel for us? Yeah. Like that's what you become known for. So I don't know if you would stand behind this, but in, in terms of if you want to be a content creator, if you want to be a creator of any sort, whether it's a comedian or whatever, I would say start with the topic that mm-hmm. actually fits authentically into who you are. So that way, when it does become well, it might take longer to become well known, but at least when it does, you're not doing something you hate. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not just a viral hit for one thing and you carry the trend on. And have you ever felt that way with your with your platform? Like with SLR Lounge, have you ever gone to a point where you're like, man, I wish I could take a break from this and do something else entirely? Or how does have you ever had right that? Right now, process? brother. We're there. (laughs) No, I mean, like I, I enjoy photography and I think it'll always be a part of who I am and what I do, but it's such a small piece of who I am that people don't realize. Yes. So I'm like, you know what? And and I kind of feel like you have to have, I can't just go and create a podcast or some new platform and be like, I'm known for this now because I haven't established myself in that. Right. So my first step to deviating was actually thinking, what do I want to, what do I want to do? And I was like, I want to write something. And I was like, what topic am I most passionate about? And it was relationships. And I'd spent over a decade studying and I, I don't don't think I've actually told, this is a first for me on the podcast too. So, um, the, this book, stupid, simple relationships is a case study. So it's a, it took about 10 years because it includes case studies from all of my clients. So you, an interesting thing happens Pratik, when you, when you hold a camera, when you have somebody's trust and you're holding a camera, they will actually behave naturally. Now, mm-hmm. when they go into a counseling office, you know, because their relationships are not functioning correctly. First of all, when it comes to a friendship, they're never going to do that, right? You just let friendships go. You don't, you don't tend to work on them, but if it's something more significant, maybe you go to a counselor and when they do that, they speak very inauthentically. The person Mm -hmm. is taking notes. You know that this counselor is judging you. You know that, you know, your, your significant other is there. So you present the version of yourself that (laughs) you think is okay to present, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I thought this, this is super interesting because I was going through this divorce struggle, um, marital problems for 15 years and then eventually divorce. And I was like, I think wedding photography and my clients is a place where I can actually learn from. So Mm -hmm. over the last decade, I started documenting anonymous data. So just taking a couple, giving them a fictitious name and then writing down nuances of how they interact with one another. And I had about 500 of these four or five years ago. And I was like, I think I have a book here. And so I developed a framework for not just my whole argument is that a romance, a business partnership, a friendship, a family relationship, they're all identical. They vary in intensity and Mm -hmm. obviously intimacy, but outside of that, they are all identical. So the entire framework that I present is just how to have better relationships. So my stepping out of photography begins with, I'm going to establish some level of authority Mm-hmm. first and then say, now I'm going to speak on more subjects, but I don't think yeah. you can just deviate without having that thing to say, this is why I'm going to talk about other things. Does that make sense? Like you have to have something concrete and a, a good mission statement effectively to, to get, go forward. And also yeah. how, how can people get this book? I'm very curious to read it. So it's going to be released in 2021. Oh, I'll, I'll send you though, a advanced reader copy if you'd like one. Oh my gosh. Yes. I would love it. Cause I, I kind of in the same mindset as you where I really enjoy 
just studying people and different thought processes and how they operate. And I've, I've wondered that, but I've never, I've always been kind of scared to say something like that because I never really had enough basis to, to say that, like having how all these different relationships are kind of the same, but yeah. different densities. Yeah. And that's really fascinating. It's a good premise. So that's the, uh, yeah. So it's, it was a fun process, but I think I very much to go back to your question, I've, I've gotten tired of the photography conversation. Number one, yes. because I feel like photography is so much more than what people make of it. You know, That's what, yeah, it's getting watered down more than ever. Yeah. And the consumer, you know, when they come into this area or, or a new photographer comes into this area, what they make of photography is camera and lenses and flashes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, what photography mm -hmm. actually is, mm -hmm. is none of those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's psychology. It's getting your client to be comfortable. It's, it's human interaction. It's formulation of concepts and, and planning and preparation and, and visualization. Wow. And it's yeah. none of those things. Or, or when you get the, when you get people who say, I don't know what concepts to shoot, or I don't know what to shoot next. Yeah. That kills me inside because. I want to kind of wish for them to develop a framework in order to create concepts within themselves or to look within and figure out what it is that they want to shoot. Like, is there a process in which someone can go through to figure out what it is they genuinely want to shoot without asking that question outward? You know? Interesting. Uh, my, my first inclination would be to copy. Yeah. Go and, and, go and grab 20 images from your favorite people and, and go and like that, that to me should be the first step. Should it not like mm -hmm. to, to go and replicate because in the yeah. process of replicating, you're going to screw it up. You're going to find where you naturally want to take something. You're going to, but I, I feel like people ask, you tell me this, people ask how I can be creative. How do I formulate ideas when they haven't yet developed the muscles? Right. Like right. their, their creative muscles are not developed yet. Mm -hmm. hundred percent for sure. The same thing goes for Photoshop, right? Because they, they'll capture a file or they'll capture a photograph and they'll take the raw file into, to post-production and they'll ask, how can I do this? Or how do you edit a raw file? Yeah. And for me, the way that I edited a raw file in the beginning and the way that I learned these things was playing around with it. I literally didn't look to anyone else and say, how did you actually edit that photograph? I would go and play with the sliders and say, what is the slider doing? Yeah. And why is it doing that? And just give, get a better physical understanding of what's happening. And then I had my answer. It wasn't here, are the particular settings and steps in order for you to edit the raw file Yeah. that everyone should do, but oh, here's what the sliders are doing. And, and let me understand that first before I, edit. it's like a, taking a test. You have to understand the concept of what it is that thing is doing to, to explain it and also understand what to do with the raw file. So the answer can often come from within again, like just by playing with it, you end up understanding what to do with the raw file because you understood what it does and you told yourself, now I know what to do with the raw file. For sure. I mean, and going back to that whole cooking analogy, you know, when, when someone asks how they can be creative, it, it's, if you're approaching cooking, you're not going to be like, you know, how do I just formulate my own dishes? You're going to, yeah. you're going to go and find recipes. Mm -hmm. And then with enough time and muscle memory, you start to realize, Hey, you know, paprika would be good in this. And you start to kind of create your own recipes out of the things that you're, you're learning and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But that, that to me should be the process of like going and like developing these muscles first mm -hmm. versus the, the thought of, I don't know what to shoot next. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> the muscle analogy is actually really great because we think of concept building as a linear thing or like a binary thing where it's either on or off, but it's kind of like when you're retouching a photograph and you're learning how to see what to fix it, that meant muscle as well gets better over time. And sure. it's not, it's not one day you learn it and one day you don't know it. It's a, it's an eventual growth. And I never really thought about creativity like that, where the creativity is a muscle that grows through nurturing it. And it's not going to happen immediately. Once you understand how to be creative, it will yeah. grow. 
Well, I think you you touched on at least the thing that I'm most hot on next is a framework for creativity. And that's my analogy for it is that creativity is muscle memory. It's yeah. But do you have other aspects, other interests of your life where you see that come into play? Like what are some of your other interests other than photography? <laughs> Um, I would say probably, and this is probably photography related, but community building, like okay. honestly, is something that I do as, as my passion. Cause I don't get paid to sit on Facebook talking to people who ask questions. You know, mm. I don't, I don't, it doesn't, I don't have to do that. I don't have to go in my group and be like, yeah, Hey, what's going on? Like great work. And, but I do that because it's an innate thing. Yeah. And I've learned to also maximize a little bit more of my time and, give feedback without overindulging my myself because sometimes people they will really put themselves into like one conversation and then they realize they're tired and they can't give their energy to other things that they have prioritized during the day for sure and so for me like having that balance is really important and having that that social How, how do you prevent yourself from going into these deep dives on these combos I just, I, I, I learned this because of my retouching clients. So being able to work for photographers that are already really great at their work and their jobs, I learned from them that you have to be very concise with your answers and also very direct. Mm-hmm. And first I was offended by that because when I first started communicating with these people, I was very excited when I first started retouching. I was like, wow, this is great. I'm getting to work with so-and-so. And so I'll be very ex- explanatory about every step that I do. Like, here's the files and I hope you like this. And I did this for you and all this stuff. And they would respond with, oh, this is great. Thanks. And that's it. And they would move on. I was like, wait a second. They couldn't like give me 10 more seconds and tell me that how much they loved it and how much they were yeah. proud of me and all this stuff. And then I realized something. People don't have time for that. Yeah. Like people don't have time to just go off on a, on a huge tangent and tell you all these things. So... I learned that you have to be very concise with all your communication and say everything that you need to without feeling like you owe them a a massive explanation of everything. Like you can just say the basic things and move on and and not worry that your tone of voice might, might sound offensive to people, you know, as long as you've answered the question. No, for sure. That's a, not a necessarily easy thing to learn. I feel like I, especially in the creative fields, people are so attached to their work and ideas that criticism doesn't go over well, that short messages don't go over well because you want, you want those reactions. Like Mm -hmm. people will be like, like how many photographers have sent their clients photographs? Mm -hmm. Uh, How many artists have sent their clients, their product and received that short email? This is great. And been like, Oh my gosh. (laughs) Can you believe that that's all they said? Can you believe the nerve of these people? And in reality, they're like, we're ecstatic about it. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like the guy is literally jumping on his laptop, checked his email during lunch break while he's eating. He's like, this is awesome. Thanks. And he's like, done your jets back off. And that's probably what's happening in the background. For sure. (laughs) But again, it's almost like this, um, another byproduct of being so well connected Mm -hmm. is that we're so disconnected. (laughs) Like, like (laughs) I can hop onto a group and Pratik is going to answer my question when I post it, or I can call somebody and they have a cell phone that's always with them, or I can text them if they don't answer this accessibility has made us completely disconnected from the fact that everybody has their own lives. Like everybody has other things going on. Like we have other friends outside of Facebook. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> so I have, I have to say like, I, I don't know what it is, dude, but over the last six months I have, uh, I'm on Facebook. I'd say all of 2020 to get my business done. And then I get off. Are, are you still enjoying it? I am. And I, again, it comes back from the, it comes back to, I just naturally enjoy communicating with people. Yeah. So I understand the perspective of not enjoying it physically, but I still enjoy like TikTok more than Facebook now. Yeah. Sure. I still enjoy it a lot more, but that's by design though. They know what they're doing. 
And I, I'm letting them do that. So. <laughs> You're letting them do that. <laughs> it's, it's different because I also feel like, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just my own perception, but the, the Facebook communities feel so much kind of more toxic in terms of like negative energy and vibes it's and getting there. Um, yeah. YouTube is that too. Like I don't go interacting on, on YouTube comments no. that much. Uh, no. Cause it's, yeah. Like I, you can only read like, I like the before better so many times, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> any, Original. Any, yeah. Any, any person out there who thinks they're giving constructive critique by saying, uh, the before was better. You're not giving constructive critique. That is something else entirely. So let me ask this. How would you give constructive critique to someone who is sensitive to a photographer, to a creative, to an artist? It would probably be the, the old adage of the compliment sandwich. I like the sandwich. You, yeah, it's, it's tried and true. It never yeah. fails. You just tell them something good about their work first, which hopefully there is. <laughs> which hopefully there is. <laughs> I like and the, that you've tried this. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and sometimes also, there's not. Oh, yeah. there's our disembodied yeah. voice. I think also when you use that sandwich, I think it's the intention behind it. People can really pick up when somebody is using that sandwich intentionally to insult somebody. To yeah. insult so, them? Yeah, yeah. Like they don't know that this is the supposed to be the quote correct way to do it. So they're just intentionally throw it out there knowing that what they're really aiming for is that insult in the middle. What, what's what an if, example of that? What if you do open face sandwich though? Because I do that now. Like that, is that what works you do? really well. Like I end, I, I stab them first and then I end with the bandage. Like they're like, oh, thanks. Like I really, oh, so that's it. like an open face sandwich where yeah. the, cause the bread is supposed to be your positives, right? But you give them the yeah. meat first and then I you end the with avocado toast. That's what I do. Oh, nice. Avocado toast. Wow. You're, that's like super politically correct. I mean, you've made the <laughs> vegans happy. You've made, you know, anybody that wants healthy food happy. <laughs> so <laughs> critique dishes out the most politically correct critique now, <laughs> which takes us back to conforming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? I really hate your lighting, but I like your attention. <laughs> I like your attention. Well, sometimes, sometimes when you look at a shot, because you know, I want people to ask for critique. Uh, and this is in any space. Like, let, let me, let me bring this back to a, a business context, right? Cause I'll have people like friends of mine who always want me to give them thoughts on their business ideas. Yeah. So they'll be like, what do you think about this business idea? Can you critique this concept? I'm like, sure. Give me a business plan. And they're like, I don't have one. And I'm like, well, uh, you done gone effed up already. Like, like, <laughs> but that's what like these, a lot of people with their phones will take a picture without any thought whatsoever yeah. and be like, critique this. And you're like, you done gone effed up from the beginning because there was no thought in capturing the image. So like, that's my first critique. Think about what you're doing before you like, what is the purpose of this thing? Yeah. But do you tell them that though? Do you say, Hey, it's crap because there was no thought or do you, do you ask them, Hey, do you like, what is your thought? No, like I, I don't want to like, I've had personally people say things that are very much affected the way that I've, you know, approached art and business and all those things. So I don't want to ever do that uh, directly to somebody. So I will say like, you know, um, I, I will literally say, I appreciate that you're shooting and you're posting this. What I would say is, I want you to think about the premise of this photograph. Like, why are you capturing this photograph? What is the story here? That should be your first thought. So it'll look more like that as opposed to like, you know, now we know. <laughs> this is garbage. <laughs> but now, now anybody listening to this is like, oh my, that was literally my photograph. He was that saying was, it was garbage. <laughs> just gave him avocado straight up. No toast. I'm like just <laughs> toast. <laughs> I just, I love avocado. So I'm just like, I'm just going to hand you an avocado. Yeah. It's got its skin on still. You, you do what you it. want with it. <laughs> you make the toast. <laughs> you, so I'm, I can't believe that we are, we are an hour. You're good on time, right? I, yeah. I think I warned you that this is long form. So <laughs> you're okay. Okay. <laughs> I was like two ADHD people who like philosophy and shit like that. How, how, how short can it be? This is, believe me, people are enjoying or sleeping one or the other. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, we're an hour and 20 minutes. I'm about to ask, what have you been up to lately? So, <laughs> I am curious. What have you been up to lately? 
<laughs> that's actually great though. That's a good sign because most people, if they start off the bat with that question, then you know that they really didn't have as much to contribute right away. So no, they had I'm nothing glad. to talk about, man. I had plenty <laughs> to talk about before we started. To- <laughs> <laughs> so what have I been up to? Um, I would say for the most part, this last couple of years has been very interesting for me because mm-hmm. I like to do um, entrepreneurial things, as you know, by now. Yeah. Um, I love exploring new ideas. The problem with me is that, A, I have ADHD, so I cannot focus on one thing at a time. Are you no diagnosed, how- by the way? Are you diagnosed with ADHD? No, I know I am, like, for sure. You know, you're, you're like, I don't even need to I- test <laughs> Even today, even the topics that we're talking about, I'm like zoning out to other things while we're talking about it going, what did he say? Make sure I remember what he said before I actually answer his question. You're doing a good job. I I didn't notice at all. I try really hard to be on interviews. People don't know this about me. I never told anyone. But even when it comes like education or like podcasts or even Facebooks or like Instagram, I have such a hard time staying on track and I have to try so hard to do it. Oh yeah. So your question was that what was <laughs> <laughs> case in point. <laughs> exactly. So I want to do many things. I have many ideas, but I think about them a lot, but I think about them in a way where it's like, not linearly. Like I have to think about them for a couple of years before I act on it. Yeah. And that's good because the people that think about it once and then jump on it typically fail. Because they think they're going to make, they want to do it, and then they realize they don't like to do it. But when I have an idea and I think about it for a couple of years, that's when I know that I'm still going to think about it for the next two years. That's a so good measure. Would be, yeah, it would be a good. And there's a reason for that. Because if someone's reminding me about the idea constantly, if there's external little triggers that are telling me that people are reminding about it, hey, I should do it. And that has been my, that has been my beacon of light in order to know whether something will be successful or not. Yeah. So, for example, last three years, I did retouching series. I did infinite color, infinite tools. Um, Those have all been very successful, both financially as well as um, creatively and fulfilling. Like, it's not something that I have to go and be like, here's how I, here's how you can make seven figures. You know, I don't have to do that whole thing. Um, And so for me, those have been the things that have kept me the busiest and photography, because I knew that for me, you know, I wasn't going to give that up. Once I started doing retouching, I knew that eventually I wanted to come back to photography. I was like, now's the chance. Like now that I'm doing all these other things, I could do photography and spend some good time on see where it goes, see where it takes me. So photography, my uh, entrepreneurial stuff, and of course, still retouching for clients. And then also um, before 2020, I did retouching retreats as well, which were um, creative cool. photography retreats that I did with uh, people all around the world yeah. and we'd go to destinations and we'd bring like six people that wanted to go. And, um, it started becoming this whole thing where people were like, what are you doing next retreat? Where is it going to be? Yeah. And we couldn't do it this year, but, uh, next year I'm gonna do more of those for sure. That's so cool. You know, one of the things that I loved is recently I actually asked you, um, I think it was about if you could take on more retouching work and you said, you said yeah. no. And yeah. I actually, uh, uh, very much, respected that i was like dude that's like in my opinion saying no to things especially once you start becoming successful at something um or multiple things like you have saying no becomes far more important than saying yes because you start getting presented with a lot of things and you can get distracted very easily so i was in my head i was like good for you man (laughs) like that is that is absolutely awesome to to know like what you want to be focusing on and to be able to say no to the products yeah. that you don't want to do. I, I I just feel like, especially as artists, right? We, we come into the industry with this starving artist mentality. And for a lot of us, myself included, it almost never goes away. Never. You're like, yeah. man. Um, cause, cause at the beginning it was hard, man. At the beginning I, I was personally budgeting $2 per meal. So yeah. if I like went to McDonald's, it was 99 cent menu for me. I'd get my two yeah. chicken sandwiches and I'd call it a day. But it was rough. And so now you get to this place where you're making good money on your shoots. You're making good money doing education, your content, your resources, all these different things that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, there's always that fear there that if I don't take awesome. this, maybe it's going to disappear. Maybe it's going to go away. Maybe I'm yeah. not going to be able to do it. Yeah. And it's difficult to get over that. That's so true. And I still feel that every day. Like I wake up thinking, God, I'm going to starve tomorrow. And I have no idea why. Like, 
<laughs> I'm just like, oh, when I go to supermarket, I'm like, should I spend the extra dollar on the name brand? And I have a like existential crisis about stuff like that. Do you, and so, do you ever think that if the world, like, if we're in a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> we're in trouble, dude? Like, our skill sets do not translate to the next <laughs> this this next world, the new world. <laughs> Definitely not. This is like, why I'm I, doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu so I can have something to contribute. <laughs> I even worry about stuff like um like for example, I invest in stocks and I, you know, and all that too and I think god, what if the entire stock market just gets deleted, you know? Like somebody just <laughs> hits a delete button or or what if like Wells Fargo just gets bankrupt and my money's gone? Like what am I going to yeah. do? Well, I there's think about that stuff. a very real possibility of just you know, stop. <laughs> um, no, there's a very real possibility of people just losing faith in currency. If people yeah. lose faith in currency, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Like even gold, I was just, again, on TikTok, I learned that people who buy and sell gold, like if you, if you spend a hundred dollars on gold, like the institution that has the gold gets a percentage, but the way they get the percentage is if it, let's say you put hundred dollars into gold uh -huh. and the institution or whatever the, the thing is. Um, gets like 10%. It's not that you get $90. What happens is you still get the $100 worth of gold, but they get $10 of inflated gold. So it's like a non-existent gold that's out there. So what, what they found is that there's more fake, well, there's more like uh, imaginary gold value out there than there's actual physical gold on earth now. Oh my gosh. So it's like gold it's like that, you know, it's it's kind of it's what all that feels like. Fiat currencies basically. It's all yeah it's my, so my background is business and economics and I find this stuff so fascinating. And what scares me most about this current environment right now mm -hmm. is it feels like we're printing our way out of a very real recession. We're printing yeah. money. And what happens with that is either you have massive market corrections, which yeah. there should have been by now, but we don't like everything yeah. is just going up. Yeah. And if that's the case, if everything just keeps going up, then you end up with massive inflation. So your dollar yeah. is now worth 75 cents. Yeah. <laughs> and we're seeing that because I'm looking around at homes around here. Yeah. And I, I, I just did a search for a five bedroom home in Irvine. There's not a yeah. single one. There's not a single five bedroom home available in all of Irvine. What does that not blow your mind? And, and these homes are selling at like 400 to $500 a square foot. Um, they're, they're, in my opinion, they're completely over beyond We're we're beyond the bubble. Like that, that's what it feels like to me. And yet the, yeah. the values keep going up and I'm just sitting yeah. here. I'm I know I, that's why I honestly haven't done any investing this year at all, just because I feel like we're, we're headed to something horrible. I, I obviously, I don't know what, but That's it just feels like it <laughs> where I am too, man. I, I kept everything in cash and, and now I'm like, I, I, you know, six months ago, I'm like, I'm going to hold everything in cash. And no matter what people do, I'm going to remember why I'm doing yeah. this. And, yeah. uh, I'll be honest. I'm like, did I make the right decision? Like normally yeah, I'm, I think I'm like, too now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, did I, <laughs> but I have to believe that this is not this isn't sustainable. I don't understand. I don't either. And I, I, and maybe it probably isn't. I'll be honest. Like it probably isn't, but maybe that's just the trajectory. Now we're going to be for the next 30 years. It's just like this imaginary trend of, ah, we'll just, we'll just make more money because if somebody said something funny, they're like, who's going to check if that's the actual amount of money that we actually have, like to back yeah. the dollar on just say we do. <laughs> No, as soon as that, as soon as the faith in the currency is lost, dude, I'm telling you, you gotta, you gotta do some Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You gotta do some, you gotta make yourself valuable other than retouching. Cause, uh, we're, well, we're I think approaching my, it. My finger is pretty strong. So I could do finger with one jiu-jitsu, like jiu-jitsu with one finger. My finger is pretty strong. <laughs> dude, I, I do not do well with, um, I've never done well with manual labor. I don't know why it's just. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think if there's something like maybe I'm not genetically disposed for me. <laughs> I don't think I am because I think like with Indian genetics, it's so difficult to do things like gain muscle and all that, because I remember that, there was, is a, that real? Is that a thing? I mean, I, I don't, I don't have anything personally? to back it. <laughs> <Are you like? laughs> this, is, this is my personal failure talking. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I remember giving it like two full years of just trying my hardest and I did pretty good. 
But then I would see people who gave it like a year and they were just incredible. I'm like thinking, <laughs> damn. That's my genetics. <laughs> That's, That's my not genetics. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see photos from your two years. I'll, I'll have, try and find it. Do you have befores and afters? I do. I'll try and find it. I never really shared it online, but I'll, I have it all with me. Well, so one of the things that we didn't talk about yet is um, your wife, Bella, which we need to have Bella on the podcast too, but she's an incredible photographer in her own right. Like she is just as successful as you, if not more so. <laughs> Uh, she's and all right. she does, what's that? <laughs> she's all right. <laughs> she's all right. You're like, I wouldn't say that by <laughs> no, I'm kidding. She's great. Um, her, her work is, is, is stunning. Um, yeah. but between the two of you, I'm, I'm so curious, like, do you both enjoy photography enough that this is like a big thing between the two of you that like you both kind of derive experiences around, or are you usually looking to do other things outside of photography when you guys are together? We, when we're together, we try and do other things just because, uh, she's also a little bit more, uh, more burnt out with photography uh -huh. um, cause she's been doing it for a very long time. And, and uh, she's trying to explore what other medium she's, she's good at yeah. and, um, she wants to do. So I'm, I'm trying to encourage her to take her skill set and her experiences and do something different. But when we're together, we, are, we do like to go out to eat a lot. We like to travel and explore different places. Um, but we always somehow, probably it's my fault, but we always try to like meet other photographers in different locations. <laughs> and she's like, could you just not have a meetup in one city, like any city? Just don't meet photographers. Just, but I'm like, but it's the coolest feeling in the world. Like going to the remote island of Bali and being like, who's in Bali in this place? And they're like me. I'm like, yes, I found someone. <laughs> How, when could you ever do that in history? Just, That's true. just traveling for 50 hours somewhere, landing and being like, hey, who wants to have dinner? Like, how could you, who? You know, I, I, can, I, I can see both sides of this <laughs> argument. <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying, but I also know where Bella is coming from. True story, by the way. Like everywhere I'd go, even if she's there or not, I would land no matter how tired. I'm like, who wants to get coffee or who wants to go meet up? And then like, I'd meet some of my best friends that I still have today just because I did that. And, uh. And I never take for granted the network that I have and the reach that I have. But do you feel like a lot of people that go to the meetups and a lot of people that want to meet you just want to get something from it? Oh, definitely. I, I, that's, that's a clickbait. I'm like, yeah, come learn things. And then I'm like, Hey, I want to learn oh, things about you. you actually, <laughs> wait, do you actually put it out there? Like come learn something? No, 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 I don't. Okay. But that's the, that's the, um, assumed, assumed thing. Like I want to meet up and have coffee. I'm like, cool. Because <laughs> sometimes I'll, I'll be honest, I, I sometimes have issues with that as like, yeah, I want to have a, a gathering and a get together, but I don't, I don't want to be the, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to be pie. I don't want to be YouTube, yeah. you know, pie, the, the, yeah. the one that's supposed to be teaching. Like when, when it gets to that place where it's like, I, I've had so many of those events where it almost mm -hmm. feels like it becomes a workshop and I'm like, yes. this is no longer relaxing. This is. Mm -hmm. This is like, I just want to hang out with you guys and talk. Like, let's, yeah. I don't want to be teaching a workshop right now, Yeah, but that's so often the way that I feel like it goes. But I think you can also lead it there too. And I, I know what you mean. Like it definitely goes to, goes there at some points, but then I always, it becomes like a podcast where I start asking them questions about things that are not related to it. Then the conversation automatically just shifts in that direction. Yeah. When they have stuff to talk about, but sometimes yeah. they don't. They know. And then you're like, shit, well, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> like you, your food hasn't come yet. <laughs> it's like, Oh, that was for you. Enjoy it. <laughs> that was for you. <laughs> the check is also for you. you take that too. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Bella just wants to like, there has to be that, that thing too. This is what's interesting is because she has a huge following as well, right? Like it, hundreds of thousands of people follow yeah. Nobella. She more people know her than me. So it's like amazing that so she has that fault. It's it's funny that she's like, she's like, Pratik, I just want to have you and not share you. And you're like, I don't mind sharing you so much. You should go and do something too. It's funny. Yeah. Now that I think about it, it's probably the worst decision to do because we'd be in like romantic places like Bali, for example. Just like, hey, but then like Joe's there. But Joe's there. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I, I can see like the, 
I, I can see both sides of it. I think it is fun and interesting. It'd be, it'd be really fun if both of you like enjoyed it as much as, as <laughs> the other, <laughs> but I have this tendency too to like, whenever we go, whenever we vacation, whenever we go anywhere, and this has been minimal in 2020, but I'm usually creating content where we go. So like there's something to me that's like, Hey, if I can be on vacation, but you know, make a good amount of money, um, making content and be photographing my family. It's like, why not? It it makes me feel like I'm being hyper productive, but I I do feel like it probably annoys Yen. (laughs) Does it, does, uh, does she tell you as well? Like, do you have that conversation where like, how do you feel about this, about me creating content along the road? Not yet. Like I, not yet. (laughs) Not yet. I mean, I, (laughs) what do you mean? (laughs) We're not comfortable with conversations like that yet. (laughs) Our relationship is still super new. (laughs) I, I, I try to be respectful about it. So when I, when I sense that, like, she's kind of just wanting to chill, I'm kind of like, you know, let's just chill today. You know, let's not, let's not do anything. Um, but, but yeah, like sometimes we'll be, we'll be shooting and I will visibly see her like annoyed. (laughs) she's like do you got what you need yet and i'm like no just one more like this is how you photograph an annoyed person let's make the most of it but it it is fun being able to blend like your your passion uh i don't want to say passion uh your your career with kind of like your your interest of going out and exploring things what is you probably haven't traveled much in 2020 like you said but what is some of the favorite places you've been to Definitely Cape Town. Uh, we went to Cape Town the beginning of 2020. Um, and what happened was that we, I, I teamed up with uh, Felix Kunz. He's one of my good yeah. friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's like, Hey, I love Cape Town. You should come. You should do a retreat there. So I was like, all right, cool. Like if you have any suggestions on itinerary and what we could do and see and eat and whatever, let's make it happen. So we, we did that last year with, uh, seven, six or seven other creatives. It was That's fantastic. So cool. We got a, tremendous Airbnb, like right at the foot of the mountains and, um, overlooking kind of the city. And it was, it was a dream and Cape Town is so cheap in comparison to the dollar that your money goes really far there. Like yeah. you could live lavishly, um, in a way that you can't live here. So we did that. We did, um, Iceland as well last year. Um, we did Dubai as well. That was actually quite interesting. Um, oh, that sounds and then so much fun. We were supposed to do Bali as well, but then that got canceled this year. So we're going to do that next year as well. Now, going back to our fake guru conversation, a lot of photographers get really drawn into the idea of workshops because they think that you can make tons of money doing it. Is that been Uh-oh. your experience? Because like I find Definitely. that it's really almost a break even effort, especially when you compare it against other things that I could be doing. Yep, hundred percent. It's not. It's not even worth it. Like in terms of money, don't even bother because unless you're charging like five grand a student or something ridiculous, yeah, you know, then it's. But you know, you're right. The time it takes to fly there to prepare to get all the, the advertising done, the marketing, and then also booking the students, answering their questions, um, preparing the content for the course, and then also going there, renting all the stuff that you need to, making sure the studio and everything's fine. The stress it takes to make sure everything is aligned. Uh, and then also doing the day is really stressful because you have to a, attend and answer their questions and make sure that you know the answer to them yeah. or, you know, at least have some type of semblance of helping them if you don't know the answer. And then finally, all that's wrapped up and you fly back and it ends up taking like a couple of weeks to do a two day workshop. So. For sure. And, and, and what I found was like in doing those workshops, if I if I hired other people to do the booking and the planning, like I had a producer for one of them do all the booking, the shoot planning, everything. It was really expensive. I mean, I, I think the, the producer took like, you know, four to $5,000 of the the students money. Um, and then my models for the two days is like another two, $3,000. And then you have food and expenses and you have everything else. And you're like, like you said, even best case scenario, a two day workshop is still at least 10 days of work and planning because you have to develop all the content, you have to prep everything. Um, so walking away from it, I'm like, there are so many other things that I could have done and made substantially more doing Yeah. where, so for me, it's like, I, I do the workshops from time to time because I enjoy them and I like seeing people in person and, and, mm-hmm. and really, like you said, 
making a cool experience around a destination, I think is the way to do it. Yeah, That's, that was much better because I didn't need much planning at all. Yeah, <laughs> because otherwise it's really not worth it. But then it no. makes me laugh because all these other photographers come into it and they're like, join my workshop, come into this workshop. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there like, <laughs> you have no idea. Not only are you not qualified to be doing this, but you're going to sell two seats and you're going to make yeah. no money and, and it's going to be, but whatever, do your thing. Yeah. I do feel bad for the, the few people that they con into going to these things. Do you still do workshops or are you still, is everything now like online? So most everything, the last workshop that I did, I think was about, I want to say four years ago. Wow, so I, haven't, really? I haven't done an in-person one in a long time. It's mainly for that reason of just, it's a lot of stress and pressure. I yeah. was, um, in 2018 and 2019, I was working with Canon directly, um, to do live workshops. I liked that because they took on the majority of everything, like planning mm -hmm. everything. Like it was, you know, and I took a, a smaller cut, but I was like, man, it's so much better to just go in and just do a small piece of this. Um, yeah. But that was the last time I, I did that, man. I, I, it's a, it's a lot, dude. What is the, what is the next thing that you're excited about doing that is that you haven't mentioned yet? Is there something like in the back of your head, like, oh, I, I would kind of consider doing that, but if I had more time or if I need to, if I did more research on it. So we are working hard. Well, I would say the the podcast and the book are kind of my two biggest things, but then um, we're still doing education. I would say what I'm excited about is we're working hard on uh, artificially intelligent development, um, mm. image processing. Mm -hmm. So not from the standpoint of um, like Photoshop and retouch, but more from the standpoint of like, can we develop an artificial, an, an AI that can learn your, like what you're doing in Lightroom mm -hmm. and replicate it over images? Um, right. Yeah. I think we actually have something. And so that's interesting to me. And people who listen to this get first glance at it, right? They do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if I remember. <laughs> well, this is like the first time I've really talked about it. Um, but, but yeah, there there's, so if that comes to fruition, then that'll be really cool. Because I, I think at this point in my career, the things that excite me are things that, that really either... I feel like it either needs to, uh, I don't like the word revolutionize. It, it either needs to change our industry and the approach to like how we do something as photographers, or it needs to be broad audience and helpful to many. Um, mm -hmm. those are kind of the only two things that excite me. Like if I'm going to do anything in the photography side, I want it to be something that's impactful in the industry. And if I do anything else, I want it to be broad audience where it has application beyond, uh, photography. But that's about it. Like, there's not too much that excites me beyond that now. Is that weird? It is kind of scary because I felt the same. Now I'm like, what about what about anything else? And I don't know. And I'm trying, I'm trying to discover what like the next thing is. I feel like we're just constantly chasing the like the next thing. You know, like we're just we're just thinking about what's the next thing while we're doing the thing we're supposed to do right now. And I I, I thought about that because I remember watching um, a program. It's a channel called NHK. It's yeah. the it's a Japanese. Um, uh, it's like a news network, but also interviews people and she has like showcases of really creative, interesting people in Japan. And in Japan, they always have, as you know, people who've been doing skills for forty years. Like that's all they do. Like they yeah. just like weave a basket for forty years. Or that's true. They might, make ramen. They might, yeah. yeah, or for whatever. And they don't. They don't seem to have a desire to do other things after that. Like that it's is just, interesting. Yeah. And I was like, why am I not like that? Like, why, why can't I just do the one thing and that's it? Like, why can't I just retouch and do nothing else? And why can't I be satisfied with that? Is something wrong with me or is it because we're just built different? Like, is it, I don't know what that was, but I, when I realized that, oh, I, that got me thinking about that a lot. What do you think it is? I think it's because it's our inner desire to explore and continually evolve. Because even with my family, like my background, my grandfather went from India to Africa to set up business. Mm -hmm. And once he set up the business there, he expanded into other businesses. And then once he was done with that, and then when he passed away, like 
my dad came to the U.S. for a better life than that. Like even mm-hmm. though they were set in Africa, they still came to the U.S. and then they set a business here for better education, and then they look for other things. And now here I am thinking, you know what? Education is not good enough. I don't care that I graduated in the United yeah. States. I don't care about my degree. I'm going to go into this thing that other people can't do. Yeah. And so then that happened. And then I was like, once I did that, I'm going to do something else. It's this is constant. I don't know if that's genetically inherited or if that's just, I don't know. Like maybe that's a, a genetic thing from our history. No, I, I've wondered the same thing um, because there are some people, I remember this way back. I thought about this question way back as an accountant. Um, you know, this was, at that point in my life, I would say that I was um, religious and spiritual, whereas now I feel like I'm just spiritual and I dismissed religion altogether. But back then, I would pray every day just to enjoy my job. Like, yep. make me just want to do accounting and nothing else. And really? because I was I was very depressed. I hated accounting and I hated, like, my job. I hated, like, there was so much. Um, it was a very dark time in my life um, and a time that, mm-hmm. honestly, like, there was two times in my life that I was, like, considering suicide. And that was one of those times. And the other time was, like, going through my divorce and, and the years leading up to it and everything. But that was one of those times. And I, I just prayed like, can I please just enjoy this? I have coworkers that just enjoy this. This is their one and only career. This is the only yeah. thing that they want. That's all I want. I just want to be satisfied with this one thing. Yeah. It obviously never happened. I never got that enjoyment. And two years later I left, but now I'm, I'm the same as you where like, I guess what I've equated it back to is the times that I find the most enjoyment is when I'm on a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, my personality, my, my, in this book, I talk a lot about core values and, and one of my core values is, uh, personal development and growth. Like I want to be the best version of myself that I can. And mm-hmm. what I enjoy most about it is the process, this journey that I'm on to, to, from one thing to the next. Mm-hmm. So when I feel like I, I know I don't, I don't know everything there is to know about photography or lighting or anything like that. I, I'm far from that. But what I have done is I've, I've done what I've wanted to do in this space. Mm-hmm. And I feel like now it's time for something new to be back on the journey again. So whenever I feel like I'm in that space and I've done the things that I set out to do to begin with, I start getting that itch again. What's, yes. what's going to be my next journey type of thing. But I've wondered the same thing. And I, I've honestly, I've, I've tried to change it in myself and that didn't work. So the only thing that worked was embracing it. And you know what also I think it is, is that <clears throat> when you're in the process or this journey, you get this sometimes, f- or this enjoyment process, you get this feeling of like suspension of reality. Like you, you, you tend to forget about everything else. You know, yeah. Everything else is forgotten except that one point in that one moment in time. Or you feel happy and nothing else you're thinking of. For sure. And I feel like this the whole reason why we like this journey so much is because we feel alive, we feel focused. And regardless of what that journey is, whatever we're feeling at that moment is why we're taking that journey. It doesn't even matter what that end result is. Yeah. But that's why we're taking it. And the same thing with retouching. While I'm retouching, I'm actually feeling like I'm not thinking about anything else. My brain is at a different wavelength altogether. And at that point, I can be very creative and think of things. Like even on this podcast, being here right now, for the past two hours, I really have not thought about things that I have to do today. For sure. Except for this one moment. And it's making my brain at a particular place where I can think of things that I would normally not think of in a way that I would would think of it normally. So Yeah, that's you know, described that. as kind of being in the zone, right? You get that yeah. you get that hyper focus and uh what is it called? Do you um, know the exact term? There's a I, I say the term of constantly, but it's, it's that, I know it's what that you mean. you're in the zone. You're, 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 you're tuned in on a level where you're not thinking about anything else. And, and some of the things that I love the most in, in my life, um, is because it gives me that. So jujitsu is one of those where like when I'm doing jujitsu, I'm not thinking about anything else. Um, same thing with this podcast. And the reason why I selected the podcast and writing and things like that is because I think this could be my ramen, you know, this could be my, like, I I could actually do this for the next 40 years. And it, it fit, it feeds my personal core value of growth and development and education, 
while also doing something. And I think if you, if you tune into that, if you can tune into the thing that ties into your value, then you've got your ramen. You've got that one thing that you can focus on for the rest of your life. Yes. But it took me a long time to realize photography wasn't that It, it was the framework piece of it. Yeah. And I think part of the photography was that the part of meeting people, the part of the different stories, the part of, you know, the variety. But then with this platform, it's it's like ramen that has multiple varieties because now, even though you have like ADHD and even though you want to do multiple things, this platform is very chameleon-like where you can focus on people who are doing multiple things. For and, sure. And, and concepts. So you're, so it's the same, but different every single time. And it's perfect for us. I agree. Like I can focus on just being a good host and Mm -hmm. learn from all the people that I get to bring on. So yeah, it's a very interesting thing for me. And I'm, I'm curious if, you know, 10 years down the road, will I feel the same itch to be like, okay, I've done this now. I want to go do something else now. (laughs) I don't know, man. What is the default state for people? Do you think most people I guess, I guess the thing is we are lucky to have found at least one thing in our life that we love to do for sure, because most people don't get there. And that's why they're watching things like TikTok because they get excited seeing other people find things that they've loved to do and they hope and wish they do one day for sure. And so for us to find multiple things that we have done well and also enjoyed is the, probably the biggest life goal that we could have accomplished. And I think we don't think about that, but we should definitely give thanks to have gone there. I agree. Um, and been there for sure. I agree. I, the default state, the only thing that I can think of is I think for the vast majority, the default state is change. Mm. I think that's the only constant is change. Um, yeah, I think the few and far between are the ones early on that find their ramen, the thing that they can do for the next, you know, 50 years. Yeah. But I'll let you know in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be in the same spot. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I could talk to you forever and I super appreciate you coming on. This has been super enjoyable for me. Um, Anthony, I hope you have enjoyed it from your, he's been taking notes this whole time. So it yeah, I really like liked it. <laughs> Good. So why don't we, uh, why don't we close this out? I, I, I hope to have you on again, um, in not too long. And let's also bring Bella on here in the meantime, though, for our listeners, uh, check out Pratik's work. I mean, his work is incredible, but once you see it, you're going to want to learn for Pratik and you should, he is literally, I can't think of another retoucher. In fact, in our industry, that is a better person to learn from, um, the best person to learn from one of the most talented people that I know, I should say skilled, because I feel like you've worked hard to develop those things over time. Um, infinite tools for, uh, so we'll link those up on the uh, description and show notes, but infinite tools, as well as your education is available on the portraitmasters.com, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Did we catch everything? Solstice Restouch on Instagram. What else we got? Also, retouch, uh, infinite color, infinite tools, uh, the retouching series, and that's it. Yeah, that's, well, that's <laughs> that's a lot, <laughs> but, but that is it. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Pi. Really appreciate it. This is awesome. Okay, we'll see you guys. 